Our scripture this morning is found in Numbers 15, verses 38 to 40. It says, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I asked Miles to bring the little pulpit up here, and he said, no, you can't do that. You're too short. We can't see you if you speak from down there, but I'm going to do it anyway, because last time I spoke here, after the sermon, I almost fell down the steps because my foot gets so sore at the end, <laughs> so I don't want to do that, so I'm going to walk down to begin with. I'm inspired today. Are you guys inspired today? You know why I'm inspired today? Because Alex is here. I haven't seen her for a long time. It's so awesome to have you here. And I have two friends here. John and Eileen are here. You know, New Year's, New Year's Day in the morning at 9 o'clock over at her house. You guys need to all come over there. I'm inviting you all over there. <laughs> she makes these, these pancakes that are not like any pancake you've ever seen. They're about the size of just a little bit smaller than a baseball, larger than a golf ball. It's a round pancake, spherical, not just a circle round. And, and she has to do it in a really incredible way. She takes this pan and she flips the pancake like this the whole time. You know, no, not really. She, she has this special pan that has these little dips in it. 
and she pours some batter in it, and, and, and after it gets done about halfway, she flips it over and flips it over, flips it over, flips it over, flips it over. When it's done, she puts them in a pot, and then you, this is the best part. You dip it in a little bit of butter, and then you dip it in a lot of sugar. <laughs> it is just to die for. She does that every New Year's. I won't tell you where she lives. She'll have to tell you that if she wants you to come over. <laughs> It is so neat. It's called Abel Skiver. It's a Scandinavian uh, type of food. Yoli and I went through a Scandinavian town one time down in California. And what was the name of that town? Solvan? Solvan. And if you ever get a chance to go down there, it is, oh man, it is just incredible. Down in Southern California, Solvan. Uh, every year they have a, have a special Scandinavian festival some type, I don't know, but that's where I first saw Abel Skiver, man, I just could not get enough of it, so we went into one of the stores, and we bought one of those things, and then we learned to make it, and it, oh, it's just, just awesome, but the person that knows how to make it best is Eileen, she, she's got it down, very, very good. Uh, we're going to be looking at a text today, a, a kind of a part of a chapter, it's found in Mark chapter 5. And before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer and ask God to guide us because as we open up his word, I believe it's really important that he, he gives us all the information he can and, and that we don't miss anything. And if we don't ask for his help, I, I believe we might miss quite a bit. So let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We're so blessed with the stories that you have given us especially these stories that we find that have, have, have different meanings to them, have, have more meanings than just the story itself. And I pray that today as we go through this story, that you will give us more and more insight, helping us to understand your word, how you want us to be so much a part of your family, how you want to, 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 to be in a covenant relationship with us. We thank you, Father, so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God is so amazing, you know, and, and, and the way the Bible is, is written, uh, you, you take a story and you read it and you think, well, that's just a really amazing story. And then if you take that same story and you read it more and more and you try to really dig deeper into it, you find out that there are some incredible parallels in these stories. And Mark chapter 5 will find that. Mark chapter 5 is, is a story told, it's also written out by Matthew and written in, uh, see, Matthew chapter 9. And you find it in Luke chapter 8. But I like the way Mark wrote it. He's got more detail in it, and, and it just, just comes alive, I think. In Matthew, I mean, Mark chapter 5, we're starting in verse 21. And, and it starts out with, now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Well, where is this? <laughs> well, the story just before this is really incredible, too, but we don't have time for all these different stories. We could really back up a long ways in Mark, but you probably don't want to be here till 3 o'clock. I don't want to be here till 3 o'clock. <laughs> But just before this, there were several things that happened. He's going back to a place where he had just come from, okay? So now, earlier, he had gone across the Galilean Sea. And this is when that big storm comes up. The big storm comes up, and, and he's sleeping in the back of the boat because he's so tired. And the disciples are all worried about it. And they're saying, oh, no, we're going to all perish. And then they look back, and they see Jesus sleeping. And so they wake him up, wake him up, and say, hey, we got to help. You got to help. You got to help. And so then Jesus calmly w wakes up, and he stands up, and he says what? Peace, be still. And then the, all the winds just stopped. You ever think about that? All the winds stopped? Now they have to row the rest of the way across the, across the lake. They've got to work their way across now. After they get across, that's when that demoniac person comes screaming and, 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 and Jesus uh, uh, says something to them and, 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 and says he's going to cast out this demon, right? And so he, he says to them in verse chapter 8, he says, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, 
unclean spirit. And then he asks the spirit a, a, a very unusual question. He doesn't usually do this. He asks the spirit a question, and he says, what is your name? And he answered, saying in verse 9, my name is Legion, for we are many. And this legion begged and begged and begged, don't just send us out in la-la land, you know? So Jesus, that's when Jesus sent them to those swine. And all those swine go over the cliff, right? And that's when the people of the town now get upset with Jesus because they lost their livelihood. But Jesus is still has a multitude with him. And so then this multitude follows him down to the boat. And this is where verse 21 comes in. He starts to cross over the Galilean Sea, and he comes over to the other side where another multitude is waiting for him. Not just a few people. It's, it's a huge multitude, a multitude of people that are pressing so close to him. Some are sick, maybe. Some are just want to see him, to hear from him. There might be some skeptics. There might be people that just want to learn, but they're so close. <laughs> In fact, I heard one person say, that, that these multitudes would get so close to Jesus that if they greased Jesus, as much as they pressed against him, he would pop up out of the middle and probably land in some other town because they would press so tightly up against him. So that's the beginning of the story. Jesus crossed over again in a boat, and he's on the other side. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now we know most of the time, when we hear a story about the rulers of the synagogue, those rulers were always out to get Jesus, asking him a trick question or something. This ruler was different. This one believed in Jesus. He had heard about him. He believed in him. And now he's got a problem. Have you ever gone to the hospital and visited somebody in the hospital? Especially somebody that, that you knew didn't really care about Jesus didn't care about the Bible or anything, but their parent was sick or somebody in their family was sick or they were sick, and you say, can I pray for you? Oh, yes, please do, you know? <laughs> Life changes when you're sick, when you're in, in, in a desperate mode. And, and this man, this man was in a desperate mode. It says here, verse 2, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came and his name was what? Jairus? Jairus. Jairus by name. And when he saw him, saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now, it sounds like he just walked up to him, you know. But remember, there's this big crowd, a thick crowd, a strong crowd. He had to fight his way through there. He had to push and push and shove and shove and make his way, force his way up there to see Jesus. And when he sees Jesus... He, it says he falls at his feet. He doesn't just say, hey, by the way, I've got a sick daughter over here. I was wondering if you could just come by and, and, and help, help her out. He is desperate. He takes and he falls down at his feet, probably grabbed his ankles, which was very customary because remember when Jesus was raised from the, from the tomb and, and Mary comes? And she falls at his feet, and Jesus says, no, 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 don't detain me. I've got to go see my father. She was hanging on to his ankles. It was very customary. Hang on to your ankles. That's very serious. Don't disturb anybody. Just talk to me. Don't, don't turn away. Talk to me. I really need your help. And so he begged him, in verse 23, begged him in earnest, saying, my little daughter, she lies at point of death. And right here in Luke, Luke says she's 12 years old. That number is very important. Whenever you read something in the Bible about the number 12, it means something. It's not like there were two people or one person, something. The number 12 means something. She is at the point of death. She's, she, she may not even take another breath. And can you imagine if you had a, a daughter or a son that, that was at that point, you'd do anything, wouldn't you? I remember a long, long time ago, my son was two years old, and we had a really bad car accident, and he was thrown out, and I was thrown, we were all thrown out. This is before the days of, of seatbelts, you know? 
And when you got hit really hard, you'd usually end up outside of the automobile. When he was thrown out, he landed some distance from me, and I could see him out of the corner of my eye, and he just wasn't moving. And when you see that, and you know what had just happened, I feel like, probably like Jairus did. It's like, the end has come, you know? That's the very, very end of your relationship with this person. He, uh, as he was laying there, I asked one of the, the med techs that came to, to at least lay him closer to me. And so they put him up over my arm. I was paralyzed and I couldn't move, but I could move my head, which I, I found out that when you break your neck, you shouldn't move your head around. <laughs> but I did, you know, I was looking around trying to figure out what's going on. I probably wouldn't have the troubles today had I not done that, you know, but, uh, but, but they laid him right here and I could hear him breathe even to this day. Just very shallow breaths. And he wouldn't move, he was, but he still breathed, you know. And that gave me hope. Jairus, he had hope that Jesus was going to be able to help him with his daughter. But he knew that Jesus needed to be there. He wasn't like the centurion who said, no, 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 don't, don't bother coming. Just say the word, and I know that my daughter will be healed. This one says, come, you've got to heal my daughter. And he begs him, and he prays, and he earnestly begs him, and begs him, and begs him. And he says, come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and that she will live. We do laying on of hands here, when we do an anointing of an elder, or a deacon, or we do an anointing of somebody who is sick. Uh, we do a laying on of hands. And I used to always think, maybe that's just a symbolic thing. You know, you just lay your hands on, and, and it's kind of a symbolic thing, just like the oil that we put on a person when they're an being anointed. But it's, I think there's more to it than that. And I think that when we get to heaven, we'll understand that more. But, you know, they say that if you take a picture of somebody uh, at like with an infrared camera, you'll see some type of an aura around them. I may not have any aura at all, but I, most of you do. And, and there's electrical field around each of us. Uh, like when you use your, your iPhone and your iPad or something like that, and, and you do the touch screen. It's based on the electrical field in your, in your skin. That electrical field must do something somewhere. Uh, our brains are electrically controlled, aren't they? It's, it's all electricity, you know, going around and stuff. It's incredible. They, I remember hearing this story about this guy. He, I don't know, I don't remember if they were doing an experiment on him or, or if he had some type of real serious surgery, but, but the top of his head was removed, and they were probing different places. And they touched this one place, and, and to him... He was all of a sudden transported into this room that, that he had been in somewhere along his life. And he remembers seeing the clock, the clock with the details and all these other details in the room, the people in the room, as if he was standing right there. It was stored in his brain. Isn't that incredible? Boy, today, computers, computers, if they could keep that much memory th without expanding, it'd be incredible. Now... We're so limited in the amount of space that we can cram our information into, you know. But God has made our brains so that it, it just never ending. And every little detail is stored into our brain. Kind of helps us to understand that we need to be careful as to what we watch <laughs> and what we allow to come into our senses. Yoli and I were watching a program last night, I think it was, with Sean Boonstra the avenues in which Satan uses to enter our brain through our five senses. And every one of those is, a, is like a gate. And we open it up, we allow Satan to come in. Or we close it and don't allow him to come in. It's our choice, the choice that we have. But Jairus, Jairus is in a, in a real panic here. He knows that Jesus is being detained by this crowd. You know, when you're in a crowd, you don't walk very fast. When, when you're with other people, you don't walk very fast. 
Yoli and I have gone with some of our, well, they were older folks now. They're probably, they were probably our age now. But anyway, they, you try to do something. You try to plan something. You go to the fair or so place. When you're with a crowd, you can't go from one place to the other very quickly. It always moves forward. Well, that's the way Jesus was. Every time somebody said, oh, could you bless me? He'd stop, he'd bless them. Could you heal me? He'd stop, he'd heal them. Every time somebody needed something, he would turn to them and, and help them. I don't think there's a time in the Bible, actually, when, when Jesus was sincerely asked something, some help for something, that he ever refused it, did he? He always would take time to help somebody, to heal them, to comfort them, to give them a word of encouragement whatever it might be. I think we can access Jesus the same way today. And I think that if we really, really thought about it, whenever we asked him in faith, in that type of faith, that he would answer us. Uh, I think of us each having an account in heaven. We start out our life over here, we're born, and, and there's an account set up. You know, not an account of money, but an account of experiences and, and helps, help tickets or something like that, you know. And, and, and Jesus has all of those for us. And he's waiting, knowing what we're going to go through in our lives. He's waiting for us to pray so that he could, he could turn in one of those tickets, so to speak, to get us help, you know, to have us help. But there's a condition. And if we don't meet those conditions, those tickets are just piled up, piled up, piled up. And I suspect that many of us will go to heaven, myself included, and we'll get to heaven and we'll, we'll look at Jesus and we'll talk to him and we'll say, man, I sure had a rough life down there on this earth. All of this stuff happened to me. And it seems like sometimes I would pray and it would never get answered. And Jesus would take us over to that pile of tickets. He'd say, let me show you something. If you would have asked me for this, I would have given it to you. If you would have asked me for this, I would have given it to you. If you would have really asked me sincerely, I would have given this to you. But instead, they just ended up in a pile. But Jairus wasn't like that. He was begging Jesus earnestly. And that's the key, earnestly. My little daughter, she lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hand on her. That touch, lay your hand on her. There was a guy by the name of Dr. Marlow. Any of you recognize that name? Dr. Marlow, he was a psychiatrist. He did this experiment a long time ago. I think it was back in the 50s. He took these Reese's monkeys, and, and as soon as they were born, before they got connected with their mother, he took these monkeys and put them over in this cage. And it was a special cage for just these monkeys. In this cage, he had two mother monkeys that he made. One was just a wire form of a monkey, okay, just a wire form, and that was it. And that was over here. And it had ability to help the monkeys to be fed there, okay? So it was like the monkeys could go to this wire form of a monkey and be fed from it. Then there was this other monkey over here in the other corner that was made of the wire, but they covered the wire with a soft cloth, okay? Nice soft cloth. The monkeys learned that to survive, they needed to come over to this corner and, 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 and nurse over here from this strange wire thing. But as soon as they were done nursing, they would they would quickly come over here and they would cuddle with this soft wire over here, okay? And, and that would go on and on and on. And they raised the monkeys that way. Then they tried another second experiment. I mean, you would understand that that would probably happen. So they, they weren't too surprised on that. But what they were surprised about was the effect that a real mother has. These monkeys, they took and took them out of the cage, put them in another cage with Real monkeys, monkeys that moved, monkeys that, 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 that had been raised by their mothers. And they found that the monkeys that were raised by these wire things were temperamentally distraught. They would hide in the corner. 
from the other one. They would cuddle with themselves, not with each other even. Just they would hug themselves like a, like a person that has some mental issues. They might be in a room and they just get in a fetal position and just crouch down. That's the way they were. Their mental ability became very unstable. And, and it demonstrated to them that touch of a mother, that affection, that, that need for something comforting. When we grew up, when I grew up, I had this special blanket. <laughs> and, and a lot of kids do, right? I wasn't too far off, I think. I had this special blanket. But I think this blanket became too special in my life. By the time I was, I think, five, about the time I was five years old, I think, I lost it. For some reason, I go into my bedroom, and it's gone. The thing had become very ragged, dirty as all dirty. My mom would try to clean it, but if she washed it too much, the thing would just disintegrate in the washing machine. But at four years old, I didn't understand that. It was my blanket, my security, you know. And, and I, I took that thing everywhere, kind of like Linus, you know, Linus and his blanket. <laughs> and I found out later that my dad had burnt it. <laughs> It was so bad that the only way to get rid of it was to put it in the wood furnace. But it was my comfort. It was something that, that kept me going and stuff. But the touch of things is so important to us, psychologically even. And so there must be something to the laying on of hands of people. And Jairus says, lay your hands on my daughter. Verse 24, so Jesus goes with him. Doesn't just go with him. He, he moves as much as the crowd would allow him to move. And in Capernaum, the, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of it, but the streets become very narrow in places. And so you can imagine this crowd of people narrowing into a street. It becomes tighter and tighter and tighter, slower and slower and slower. And Jairus is the whole time just like, we've got to move faster. My daughter is dying. We've got to move faster. But Jesus seems like he's not in any hurry at all. And at the same time, there's another thing that happens in this story. Now remember, this girl is 12 years old. At the same time, now, the, in verse 25, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for how many years? 12 years. From the time that this little girl was born to now, it's the same time frame. This lady, though, was much older. For 12 years, she has had this issue with this blood. So, you know, for 12 years, the problem must have been getting worse and worse and worse. And our blood is what carries our oxygen. She didn't have anything like Judy to where she could have extra oxygen. She probably wouldn't have had the strength to pull it around anyway, so I guess it wouldn't matter. She had to walk quite a ways, it sounds like, to, to even reach Jesus. But she found out that Jesus was going to be there. She knew that she had to get there. Now, this problem that she had was not a common problem. And it was not something that was socially looked upon as very favorable. She could not have association with her husband. She couldn't go to the temple to worship, right? Because she's considered what? Unclean. You don't go to the temple and make it and contaminate it, so you cannot go to the temple. She could not uh, associate with other people. She was isolated for 12 years, isolated. Even her deciding to go and venture out and, and come to Jesus was a huge thing because she had to go out to public. She wasn't supposed to do that, so she was really taking a chance to go out and do that. I'm sure it wasn't something she sat down and discussed with her husband and say, by the way, honey, I think... Jesus is coming by. I think I'm going to go see him, you know. He would have forbade it. You don't go out there. You're unclean. So she goes out. Every bit of strength that she had, she put into this. Now, Jairus, when he goes through the crowd, he's a guy, and he's strong. He's, he, he, he's able, much able, to break through this crowd. But she's not. And so she pushes hard, pushes hard. And she has to work much harder to get to Jesus. Verse 25, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. 
and had suffered many things from many physicians, meaning that she had gone to physician to physician to physician. She had gone to the physicians that in their culture did not think very highly of a woman that had those kind of problems. She had spent all of her money on that. She had spent all that she had and was no better. And then she grew worse and worse and worse. When she heard that Jesus had come, uh, was coming, she came behind him in the crowd, and she did what? She touched his garment. And that's where the text comes in that Amy read. Turn with me there to Numbers chapter 15, verse 38. This is really amazing because I thought, this is so cool here. We have her touching the garment of Jesus. Why the garment of, his Jesus, of Jesus? And why this part of it? And this is why. Numbers chapter 15, verse 38 says this. Speak to the children of Israel. Now, this is another thing that just happened. Uh, just before this, the children of Israel had learned about the Ten Commandments. They'd been practicing them. And it wasn't just the children of Israel, but it was to all of those in their camp, the, the Egyptians that came out with them, which were quite a few, uh, all of them had to keep the Sabbath day holy. And if they didn't, uh, there was going to be a punishment. But, but that hadn't happened yet. These, there was a time just before this happened. You'll, you'll come up earlier in the, chapel, in, in the chapter, and you find that there was a man that was going out picking up sticks to build a fire to probably cook something, you know, maybe even cook his manna that had fallen that, the day before. And so he's out there picking up sticks, but it's on Sabbath. That's the problem. It's on Sabbath. And so God, the, the people then find him, and they bring him in, and they say to Moses, Moses, this guy, he's picking up sticks on Sabbath. That's a no-no-no. no. And it was a big no-no because God said, thou shalt not do what? Any work on my holy day. How many days are holy? How many? One day. Thou shalt not do any work on my holy day. And he's out there picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And they grab him and they take him to Moses. And Moses inquires to God, what shall we do? And God comes and he says to Moses, Moses, I want you to take him outside of the camp. And I want you all to pick up a stone and to stone him to death. What if you broke the Sabbath and that was to happen today? Have you thought of that? Thank God is so much more lenient today than he was back then. Man. Huh? Izzy. And that's the whole thing about the story, Izzy. Because there will be a consequence when we will all be taken out of the camp and be stoned if we, not just the Sabbath, but any of God's commandments. That's amazing. And then God says, I want you to do this. And that's where verse 38 comes in. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassels that you, uh, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord. He broke a commandment. God is saying, I want you to put a tassel on the, on the bottom of their garments. That way they will always look at those and remember. When he bends down to pick up sticks, <laughs> he's going to look at his tassel and he's going to remember the Ten Commandments. And, be, and it says in verse 40, And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and to be your God. I am the Lord your God. That part there in verse 40, and to remember to do all the commandments and be holy to your God. This lady was not a stranger to that. Jesus was most likely not a stranger to that. If you look at the front of your bulletin, there's a picture of Jesus. And that's the tassels that, what's 
somebody thought of the tassels anyway, on the bottom of his garment with that blue thread there. And, and, and the lady is there reaching out, going to touch those tassels because she knows it represents the commandments, the wholeness, the completeness. It, it, it represents the holiness of God, those, those tassels there. If I just can reach out and touch the tassels, just the tassels. Thank you, Amy, for reading that. I just, I, I'm amazed at how often we find the, the Old Testament working in with the New Testament all the time. It's so incredible. She reaches out to touch the tassel, hoping not to be, not to be seen by anybody. And she says in verse 28, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I, I shall be made well. And immediately, this issue of blood, this fountain of blood, left her body, dried up, and she was healed from the affliction. Now, what I think is so cool about this is we have an older lady, an old lady, and a young lady. They represent, now get this, they represent the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'll show you why. She has this issue of blood that's always flowing, always flowing. What does the woman represent in the church, <laughs> in the Bible? <laughs> represents the church, right? <laughs> How did you get that? <laughs> and, and also the number 12 represents the church. You know, you have 12 disciples, you have the 12 gates, you have the, the 12 apo- the apostles, disciples. You have the 12, what? The 12 tribes. The 12 stars of the woman on, in the prophecy and, and the 12 foundations, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, represents the church also, okay? So, so the girl is, the little girl is 12 years old. She represents the church. The, the older lady, 12 years, she represents the church, and she's a woman. They're both women. Now, that flow of blood, the sacrificial system started when? Back with Adam, Right? And so, so that's when the flow of blood started, clear back in Adam. And it flowed continually until Jesus died on the cross. It flowed continually. This lady, this, this, this older woman, it flowed continually until Jesus healed her. You know, isn't that amazing? And, and the other thing is, on the rock where the, where the dome is, the dome of what's it called, Uh, the Mosque of Omar. The Mosque of Omar is built. It's where Solomon's Temple really was built, okay? And when Solomon's Temple was built there, they they built it there for a purpose because Isaac was sacrificed there. Or if you're a Muslim, Ishmael was sacrificed there, (laughs) okay? But Isaac was sacrificed there or going to be sacrificed there. And so Solomon builds his temple there, but he knows that there's going to be a lot of sacrifices, Lots of sacrifices. There's going to be blood, 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 blood. What are we going to do with that blood? He digs a tunnel. He digs a tunnel all the way down out of the, this, it's all solid rock. I don't know how they did it then. They didn't use dynamite. They dig this tunnel out to the Valley of Kadesh. And it's there till today, you know, that same tunnel. And the temple was situated in a way that when they did the sacrifice, that's where the blood would flow. The blood would flow through this tunnel flow through this tunnel. This woman had an issue of blood that continually flowed. The sacrifices continually flowed until Christ died on the cross. Significant about the death of Christ on the cross. Jesus, in this crowd of people pressing up against him so tightly, he comes and and he turns and he says, who touched me? Now, if you were one of the disciples like Peter, you would have come and said, you're losing it. (laughs) Come on. What do you mean somebody touched you? People have been touching you from the moment you stepped off the boat. You can't just say that in public. People are going to think you're crazy. But he turns to Peter, and he looks at Peter, and then he says, no, somebody... Somebody touched me. It says in verse 30, And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, he turned around in the crowd and he said, Who touched me? 
It's the key is, is the power had gone out. Everybody else was touching him. Everybody was touching him. The power was not coming out of God. Power was not being spilled all over the place just because they touched. It's like, it's like you and I. And I am so guilty of this. I don't say this, but it's kind of like this. You, get, you go to bed at night and you say this prayer, I lay me down to sleep and I don't know, da, 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 da. Well, oftentimes, if you think about it, our prayers aren't much different than just a memorized saying of some type. It wasn't until the earnest person comes to him and touches him that power has gone out. All of us here in the church, we come to worship God, but not all of us come in a very earnest way. And therefore, the power of God doesn't come into our lives. Let me read you something here. That's really, it's just, it amazed me because when you think of spiritual things, you think, well, coming to church and keeping the Sabbath or doing this or doing that is, is all good and, 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 and okay. And, and I heard someone say, as this pastor, he said, he said, you know, my congregation, they come to church and, and they shake my hand at the end and it's like they've punching a time clock every time they shake my hand i can tell i can tell that they're shaking my hand and saying i've done my duty my sabbath is over i'm going home and doing my own thing now you know it's all done but it's not it's it's this it's that earnest person so in spiritual things to talk of religion in a casual way to pray without that soul hunger and living faith availing nothing like jairus a nominal faith in Christ which accepts him merely as the savior of the world can never bring healing to the soul. Can never bring healing to the soul. Those memorized prayers, those prayers without, without substance. The faith, that is, the faith that is until salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. He who waits for entire knowledge before he will exercise faith, cannot receive the blessings of God. It is not enough to believe about Christ. Even, they, even, even Satan believes in Christ, right? That's not enough. We've got to believe in him, but the only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal Savior. That relationship is what he wants. That relationship which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in that, in that covenant relationship, that contract, that agreement between them. That's what God wants. He doesn't want us just to know about him. He wants to have a relationship. He wants us to interact with him, be something. Jesus turns after his disciples kind of mock him and the other people mock him. Verse 30 says, but his disciples said to him, Peter particularly, I think Luke is the one that says that, uh, you see the, the multitudes thronging you and, and you say, who, who, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. He did that. He did that because he wanted the lady to testify as to what had just happened. He doesn't want our blessings to go unnoticed. I heard a saying, I don't know if I can get this right. Uh, it's about a secret in Christianity. See if I can get this straight. Christ, a, uh, Christianity and a secret. Christianity and a secret. Christianity can be kept a secret, right? We, many of us have kept our Christianity as a secret. You know, uh, some of us who have problems working on Sabbath, uh, uh, or we go to get a new job, we kind of keep it a secret that we need to get off a little bit early on Sabbath because we don't want to be working on the Sabbath, and we wait until fall time or winter time. And, oh, by the way, uh, I don't work on Friday night after sundown, stuff like that. We keep it a secret. Well, there's a saying that says a secret Christian, the bad part about a secret Christian is, is that if you keep it a secret, it'll take the Christianity out of your Christian experience that secret will end up fading out your Christianity. But if you take that secret and you use it to expose your Christianity, it takes the secret out of it, okay? 
So one or the other is going to die out in your life. And hopefully it's the secret that dies out in your life. Because if it's not, it's going to be the, sec- the Christianity that dies out in your life. She starts to keep it a secret. She, she cowers down and tries to make her way out of the crowd. But Jesus stops. And he looked around to see who had done this thing. He knew it wasn't from the front. He knew it was from the back. He knew who it was. And he looks right at the lady. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, in verse 33, the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had just happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She represents the Old Testament, the whole truth of the Old Testament, the whole truth of the sacrificial system. Is what she's kind of exposing here. This whole truth, she she tells him. She's afraid because she's thinking, oh no, I did something wrong. Maybe I was supposed to take a ticket. Maybe maybe I was supposed to get in line. Well, there is no line. Everybody's just crowding around. But maybe I should have asked permission. Maybe he's going to take this away from me. God never takes his blessings away from us. You know, isn't that amazing? Even the Jews today are still blessed by him regardless of what they've done to him. He never takes his blessings away. But she doesn't know this. So she talks to Jesus, and the whole crowd hears this. Everything that has happened over the last 12 years. And then she says, I came and I touched your garment, knowing that you would heal me. You've got to remember that Jairus is here at the same time, pushing Jesus. (laughs) Come on. She's healed. She's done. She's okay. All right, let's go. Got to get to my daughter, okay? Jesus waits and lets her tell the story. He had said to her then, this is really cool, he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. It is your faith. Have you ever seen these faith healers on TV? They get pretty uh, animated in in all their (laughs) shows and stuff. And, And it's really interesting uh, Benny Hinn, I always loved watching him sometimes. He'd always have to take somebody and smack them on the forehead, and then they'd have to fall back, you know. That's the way they were healed. Some people, they, they get healed, and they throw their crutches out to the audience who conks somebody on the head, and they have to be healed probably. And they throw their glasses out, and they, all these different things, you know, they throw out. Do you think any of them are ever really healed? And the reason I say that is because Jesus doesn't say it's the faith of the evangelist. It's not the works of the evangelist. He always says, it is your faith that has made you whole. I think we're going to find out when we get to heaven, there's going to be some people that got sucked into some evangelist somewhere, but their faith made them whole. Their faith made them whole. Daughter, Your faith has made you whole. Jesus is incorporating her into his family. He he accepted her. What a load off of her back. Man, what an amazing thing. And then he says to her, go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And while he is still there with Jairus now, there's somebody that comes in from the back and they make their way through the crowd and they say to the, one of the disciples, they say, you know, tell your master, don't worry about coming over to Jairus' house. And Jairus hears that. Jesus hears that. Your daughter's already dead. He didn't make it. He died. He's too late. He took too long to get there. There's no way that he's going to be able to do anything now. She's gone. What a, what a terrible thing, huh? But before it gets better, it gets worse. Just like Jesus in his ministry, remember? He's with the disciples for this three years. And he's trying to tell them everything. He's trying to explain to them what's going to happen. And it always got worse, worse, worse. He dies on the cross. They think everything is done. Everything is over with. There's, there's, There's nothing left. The woman who represents the Old Testament, continually got worse. And then she got better. But while this happened, Jesus hears it, 
And he turns quickly to Jairus. He says, don't be afraid. It's okay. Don't lose faith. This is all part of the plan. Don't worry about it. You see, sometimes we may have this much faith, but we really, something's going to happen where we need this much faith. And God knows that. And no matter what, he's there to help us with that extra amount of faith. Most of the time, we usually have this much faith when we need this much faith. But, but he always compensates for that. He, he, he fills that void. He helps us to have what we don't have. He says, do not be afraid. Only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him from that point. He said, enough is enough. He says, now, Jairus, I want you to come with me. And Peter, James, and John, I want you to come with me. We're going to go to Jairus' house. No more delay. So they made a beeline to Jairus' house. They quickly got there. But there was enough time, there must have been enough distance and everything, that by the time they got there, they had all the mourners there. You know, they hired people to cry. And I, I guess what it was, I don't know, but the, whoever's house made the most noise, they were the most popular people. <laughs> I don't know. But they hired these people to cry and to wail and to make all these noises and stuff. And so Jesus comes in. And you know, when somebody dies in Christ, it says in the Bible, they're not dead. They're only what? Sleeping. Because Jesus is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living, right? So he is never the God of the dead. Satan is the God of the dead. Satan gets to have and collect all those dead people that die not in Jesus. But those who die in Jesus, they're only sleeping. It's only a momentary death. And so he says to them, he says, you guys, I want all these mourners and people wailing and making loud noises and stuff. I want you guys out of here. This girl's not dead. You don't need to be crying for her. And they laughed and they scoffed and they scoffed and they, they, they did not believe him at all. Why do you think Jesus took Peter, James, and John and not the whole crowd? It wasn't just because of time. It wasn't just because he wanted to hurry them along. Sometimes, as you probably well know, sometimes, let's say the crowd represents our, our church, okay? Sometimes the crowd influences us wrongly. It, it holds us back. The crowd was there uh, like Zacchaeus. There was a crowd. Uh, Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because he was like me. He was too short. The crowd was these taller people, and, and the crowd was between him and Jesus, and so he had to climb up in that sycamore tree. Uh, uh, Jairus, he couldn't get to Jesus right away. He wanted to, but he had to fight his way because the crowd was between him and Jesus. Same with, with the woman who had issues. The crowd is in the way, and so Jesus wanted the crowd not to be in the way. When they, when they all leave, Jesus walks into the room of this little girl. Jairus hasn't said anything. When he came in and he said to them, uh, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping, and they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother and the, of the child and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entered where the child was lying. And when he took the child by the hand, he said to her, this is really cool, if you, if you know the language especially, Talitha Kumai, Talitha Kumai. And that means, uh, little girl, I say to you, arise. What a, what a peaceful, gentle thing to say, you know? He didn't get up on a stage and make a bunch of hooey wooey dooey stuff, you know. He didn't do a rain dance. He didn't shake a bunch of flashy things or anything like that. He didn't slap her around. He didn't, he didn't shake her feet and then shake her hands and, and jump up and down. He just said to her, he just said to her, little girl, little girl, little child, I say to you, arise. Just arise. And then it says in the Bible that she quivered. The life started coming through her. She quivered, and, and she came to life, and she sits up. And Jesus says to her, 
to them, to the mother and the father, he says, feed her something. Feed her something. You know, he said the child represents the New Testament. Jesus died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, people thought it was all over with. Jairus thought his, when his daughter died, it was all over with. There was no more hope anywhere. And then Jesus raises her from the dead and has her to eat. Jesus is the bread of life, right? Jesus is the bread of life. When he raises her up and he has her uh, uh, to eat, it's like the sacrificial system is completely over. We have a new life starting now. We have the New Testament coming in. He represents the New Testament, the new way, the new life. Immediately, the girl rose. She walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. I thought it was kind of interesting that he say, don't tell anybody, she was raised from the dead. But yet all those mourners are outside. You know they're curious as to what's going to go on, so they're not going home. And as soon as she gets up and gets around, they see what happened, okay? How can it be kept a secret? In our own lives, especially this new year, I've been reading about different things uh, concerning our new year. Resolutions, you know. As a kid, I used to always make resolutions. And someone told me, you know, you shouldn't make resolutions. You break them anyway. You just shouldn't worry about it. You just depress yourself. But I don't think so. I think God thinks that we should make resolutions. And these stories here, when it talks about how Jairus came to God, to Jesus, and he, he gave all his emotions to him. He, he pleaded with him earnestly. That's what we need to do in our prayers. What is it that we take to heaven? It's our character, right? That's the only thing we take. Not the clothes on our back, not our artificial hips and limbs and all that kind of stuff, fortunately. Just our character is all we take to heaven. And it is our character that we have to really be concerned about. So I submit to you that your New Year's resolution should be something to do with building your character. I talked a little bit about these gates that we open up on our senses that, that allow Satan to come in or we close them so Satan doesn't come in. It's those things that affect our character. They're always stored in our brain. Everything is stored in our brain. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything we do, everything around us, things that we eat, things that we touch, are stored in our brain. And Satan has a way of really doing a good job of storing the wrong things in there. If we pray to God earnestly, not in these memorized, rope type of prayers, but earnestly seeking Him, pouring your whole heart and soul out to Him, then our character will become more like Christ. In Romans chapter 10, I think it is, it talks about how the doing of the word, the reading of the word and the doing of the word, it's the only way in which we can really understand who Christ is. We have to have time set aside for our own Bible study, for our own worship, for our own learning. If we don't, we're, we're not going to make it, just not going to make it. We need to understand why we do what we do. We need to understand where we are in our relationship with Jesus. Don't assume that just because things are going okay, that everything is okay, because it's not necessarily okay. Satan would love for us to feel that way. God has a special work for us. And this year, I think, my prayer is that that work would be that our characters would be really honed in to be more like Christ and to be more like him. And I'd like for us to sing now our closing song. And as we sing, uh, be thinking about that, and then we'll close with prayer.
This is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Number 524. Let us stand, please. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know that saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him all Father in heaven, I just pray that each one of us will have that faith to trust you more. Without that faith, our prayers are not effective. Without that faith, everything that we do is for naught. We need to do more than just believe in you. We need to act on it. We need to be a part of your life so that you can be a part of our life. We need to have that covenant relationship with you, Lord. And I pray that you will guide each of us throughout this new year in a way that will help us and draw us closer to you. Help our character to be formed in the way in which you would want us to be. Help us to work on even the smallest things so that we can overcome all. In Jesus' name we pray.